We all know that the newspaper business has been struggling in recent years. And newspapers are really where we get uh, the information that we need to govern ourselves in a democratic society. Um, so the question becomes, uh, given the technological and cultural changes that have put the newspaper business in kind of a bad place, what is really going to come next? Now, this is really a question that I began to explore in 2009 uh, for, a, for uh, a book that originally I had in mind that was um, somewhat hazy in my mind, but eventually became a book called The Wired City. And although I didn't really realize it at the time, a lot of my thinking for this project came out of a very influential, fairly short blog post written in the spring of 2009 by Clay Shirky, who is one of the big thinkers in our field. He wrote a well-known book called Here Comes Everybody. And the blog post that he wrote was titled Newspapers and Thinking the Unthinkable. And uh, essentially what he was arguing was that maybe there is no way out of this. Maybe there is no saving journalism as we have known it. And he said that maybe what we're living with in this period 10 years, 15 years after the rise of the internet is very much like the period maybe 10 or 20 years after Gutenberg's press had been invented where we heard a lot about, we read a lot about Gutenberg's press and the effect that it had on society. And then you kind of fast forward 100 years and there were books and newspapers and all of that. But he said, what happened in between? We've never really heard much about that. And we may be living in one of those times now. Um, the other argument that Shirky made is that no one thing will replace newspapers, but maybe many things can replace some of what we have grown accustomed to depending on newspapers to do. And later that spring, he gave a talk at Harvard, and I stopped in on it and uh, listened to what he had to say. And what he ended up saying is that among the many experiments that we ought to be thinking about in terms of replacing what newspapers used to do are nonprofit media, new forms of for-profit media, and voluntary media. And as it turned out, I didn't really realize at the time that this was what I was going to do, but I ended up giving a very close look at all three types especially the nonprofit type, um, but for-profit and voluntary as well. The voluntary aspect of this, by the way, is something of a local story, which I'll get to at the end of this talk. Now, my journey took me to look at a number of different kinds of projects. And at first, I was looking at a wide range of, of, of ideas, um, and among them was a project called News Trust, which was an early example of trying to combine social media and journalism. Uh, there was a community of users that would try to identify uh, quality journalism and rate it for accuracy, fairness, sourcing, things like that. Um, it started with a bang, a lot of uh, good buzz surrounded News Trust, uh, but it never really caught on. And it currently exists, but um, it, it never really fulfilled the promise it had at one time. Uh, that was one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum uh, was um, something called Global Voices Online, which continues to be alive and well. It was started at Harvard Law School. And I actually had a chance to interview Global Voices Central Asia editor uh, during a trip to Kazakhstan in 2009. And um, what Global Voices does is it curates the international blogosphere. 
essentially, uh, we know that there are thousands of blogs and Twitter accounts and YouTube accounts around the world, but who's making sense of them? Who is looking at this outpouring of media and saying what's worthwhile, what isn't, what seems to be factual, what seems not to be factual? And this is what Global Voices Online does. It has experts in every part of the world keeping track of the blogosphere in that region and trying to make sense of it. So that just kind of gives you a, a feeling for the range of projects that I was looking at. Uh, but what really interested me uh, was the future of community journalism. Because in many respects, what we think of as international and national journalism uh, are doing better. The New York Times is fairly healthy. Even a big regional paper like the Boston Globe is doing okay. It's at the local level that we really have to kind of be concerned. And the person who defined this problem, I think, very well was Robert Putnam, the sociologist, in his 2000 book called Bowling Alone. Obviously, these ladies are not bowling alone. Uh, but his, his argument was, uh, we used to, basically the title Bowling Alone is based on this notion that we used to bowl in leagues, but as we've become more individualistic and less engaged in our communities, now we bowl alone. And actually, the title was much more optimistic than the contents of the book, because you could see is, in the book is that we're not bowling uh, either in leagues or alone. We're staying home and watching TV. And uh, Putnam's idea was that civic engagement depends on many things, and people who are engaged in their communities, anything from coaching Little League to um, attending religious services also tend to be the newspaper readers. But as you see that as civic engagement has declined, so has newspaper readership. So how do we rebuild those community ties? And this brings me to the major focus of my research, which took place in New Haven, Connecticut. Now, why New Haven? Best pizza in the world. Uh, <laughs> But in addition to that, the New Haven, uh, New Haven is the home of a nonprofit online only news site started in 2005 uh, called the New Haven Independent by uh, a, a man named Paul Bass, who has been a journalist in New Haven for years and began this project as a way of keeping uh, very close tabs on all the goings on in New Haven. Now, there's a huge technological component to the New Haven Independent, and I want you to pay close attention here to the technology that they depend on. There you go. Um, the New Haven Independent has four full-time journalists, and they ride around the city on bikes, and um, they're, they're they're writing stories, taking pictures, shooting video, and really keeping track of everything that moves in New Haven in ways that the big local daily paper, the New Haven Register, really isn't. Because whereas the Register's main interests in New Haven are Yale and crime, um, the New Haven Independent is covering neighborhood news, uh, local politics, um, and, and, and real quality of life issues, education reform, things like that. And it has turned out to be a tremendous boon to civic engagement in New Haven. Now, how does it do that? Uh, well, first of all, um, what, one of the things that makes the independent work is a hyperlocal focus on the city's neighborhoods and quality of life. As I said, it's different from the New Haven Register, which is not a bad paper by any means, but is largely focused on the suburbs around New Haven, which is very typical of large regional newspapers. Second of all, uh, with the, the internet has destroyed the advertising model 
on which newspapers traditionally have thrived. The Independent has a fundraising base that's much more like public radio than like the traditional advertising model. Uh, where the, the Independent makes its money from foundation grants, um, sponsorships by some of the local institutions in the community, and a small amount of reader donations. And this is not an easy way to make a living. On the other hand, depending on advertising in a market that has been completely upended by the internet is also not an easy way to make a living. And it looks like the Independent is going to have no problem celebrating its 10th anniversary next year. So they have been able to figure it out. And then finally, the Independent has been able to make sense of online comments in a way that few uh, news sites have. They keep very close tabs on them, and they have sparked this civic engagement. Now, as I said, I wanted to look at other models as well. So for a for-profit model, I traveled to Batavia, New York, which is a small city in the midst of farm country, um, about halfway between Buffalo and Rochester. And in Batavia, New York, Howard Owens, a longtime journalist and media executive, uh, runs a for-profit news site called The Batavian. Covers Genesee County, if any of you know that area. Um, Howard uh, has, as I said, he's, in, he's done a for-profit model. And what you have there is close attention to the quotidian aspects of community life. If there's a, if you hear a fire hydrant, if, I'm sorry, a fire hydrant, that would be interesting. <laughs> if you hear a fire siren, fire truck siren going down your street, 15 minutes later you may read something about it on the Batavian if you log on. Uh, they do bigger stories too, they cover important news in the community. Uh, but they really try to keep on top of the little things of community life that are so important. Uh, good photography helps tell the story of the community. Howard is a very accomplished photographer. This is just one example of so, sort of the nice pictures that you see on the site. And then finally, there are about 150 ads on the site, all local, no national chains, and that in itself helps foster a sense of community. I don't think that there's a funeral home, pizza shop, tattoo parlor, or an insurance agency that isn't advertising in the Batavian. Now, I said that there's also a local aspect to this, and this is the volunteer model that I was talking about. And the local aspect to this is scheduled to unveil in Haverhill later this year. Uh, this is something that has been years in the making. Um, it's been delayed a couple of times, but this looks like the year. Uh, the Haverhill experiment uh, is aimed at filling what its founder, Tom Stites, uh, calls a news desert. And the idea of a news desert is that uh, it's kind of like a food desert. Just as a food desert does not have the kind of grocery store infrastructure people need for nutritious food, a news desert doesn't have the kind of civic information you need to have a, 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 a civically nutritional diet, as it were. And Haverhill, in some respects, is well covered. It's a local paper. Uh, there's a local daily, there's a local weekly, both owned by the same company. There's a very robust local access cable operation. There's even an online radio station in Haverhill. But they don't have an independent local newspaper, uh, as they had for many years. Uh, this is the prospectus for the Haverhill Gazette, back when people were thinking of founding it. So Tom Stites who is a veteran journalist, he's had stints at the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune, came up with this idea called the Banyan Project, which seeks to 
um, build news co-ops, cooperatively owned news sites that would be a little bit like um, a food co-op or a credit union. People could join the co-op by paying a fee, by maybe writing a neighborhood news blog, something like that. And there would also be a professional component, a full-time paid editor and a full-time paid community manager. So you have professional journalists and amateur journalists working together to try to fill this gap of community news and community engagement uh, that had developed over time. Uh, the site will be called Haverhill Matters, and if it's successful, uh, it will be the model for a number of other sites that will um, presumably roll out across the country. Uh, so that really brings me to the end of this story. Since I finished The Wired City, we've seen some very, very interesting developments in the future of journalism. Uh, and we don't know where they're going to go yet, but I think that most of us may know that the Boston Globe was acquired by John Henry of the Red Sox. Uh, very smart, very wealthy guy who is trying a number of experiments to see if the Globe can be returned to solid profitability. Uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon has bought the Washington Post, and there are a number of other experiments that we could look at. So from 2009, when the news business seemed to be on the verge of going under, there are actually some reasons for optimism today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing where we're going to go from here. Um, what I've talked about here are just a few ideas for reviving local journalism. Uh, I don't think this is the end of the story by any means. Uh, the story continues. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>